If you're listening to this podcast, you know that the success of any nonprofit organization depends on leadership and development staff working hand in hand. So we've got something special for you tomorrow, which is Thursday, April 4th at 10 a.m. There is a free webinar if you're an AND member uh, called What I Wish They Knew, Navigating the Relationship Between CEO and Development Officer. We have two fantastic presenters, Liz Ortenberger. She's the Chief Executive Officer for SafeNest, and she's going to be here with her Vice President of Philanthropy, Phil Kalsman. And they are going to be telling us how they meld their vision and direction of the Chief Executive Officer with the fundraising efforts of the Development Officer. So go to the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits webpage, scroll down to the training and events calendar and click that link. That will allow you to register. Again, this is totally free for AND members. If you're not an AND member, it's just $10. So come check it out. Um, it's tomorrow morning, April 4th at 10 a.m. Pacific. We hope to see you there. Nonprofit governance. Nonprofit answers. Nonprofit board. Nonprofit management. Nonprofit marketing. Nonprofit resources. The Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits presents Nonprofit Everything, the podcast about everything nonprofit, with your host, Andy Shurek and Stacy Wedding. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Nonprofit Everything. We're so happy to have you joining us, and we just appreciate all of you who are our loyal listeners and passing this along and spreading the word to everybody else. Please continue to do so. And of course, send us your questions. Uh, you know, you can do this so many different ways, but even if it is literally just uh, an email to Andy, an email to myself, whatever you want to do, go through nonprofiteverything.com and, you know, hit the contact form and send it to us. We promise to always keep it anonymous. So, uh, you know, your secret is safe with us and uh, enjoy the episode. All right, Andy, this one's for you. Are donor pledges enforceable? Could I actually send my unfulfilled pledges to collection? That is such a good question. Oh, I love it when we get good questions. I know. Um, yeah, um, a donor pledge is actually enforceable. So it is a it is an agreement to give you money. It's a contract. Um, and even though it might not be um, on something that was submitted to an attorney and has a bunch of crazy language in it and has three signatures at the bottom and the date and it has the word whereas at the top and all that <laughs> nonsense, it's still a, a contract. It's, it's an agreement for them to give you money um, over a period of time. Um, the, when you get down to it, like the, so this is, okay, so could, the question says, like, could I actually send my unfulfilled pledges to collection? I'm not going to address that just yet. So, so the, because that's crazy. Um, the, the interesting thing is that if, if for some reason you needed to um, get money from someone who had given you a pledge and you're trying to prove to them, I just think about it just as a thought experiment, trying to prove to them that they made that pledge, the easiest way for you to do that is to have some sort of written documentation. So either they filled out a pledge form, they wrote something down, they told you something at an event, and then you responded with something back, like a piece of paper that said, hey, this is what I heard you say. I mean, it's a good time to also get some more details about how the pledge is going to be paid. Um, one of the things development people hate doing is reaching back out to a donor that's made a pledge to ask them a clarifying question about the pledge. Like, you said you were going to give us $10,000 over three years, but then this year you gave us $5,000. So are you going to give us five thousand right. dollars next year, or twenty five hundred dollars over the next two years, or yeah. or did you forget you made the pledge? Right. So there's there's all these different questions that you can ask, and gets really confusing. So having like a pledge form that fills and sort of specifies this is what I think was going to happen, and then if the donor gets confused, because sometimes they get confused, you can send them like here's what we, we we did last time. Tell me if I'm right. You know, then it's not like you didn't know. You know, you don't look dumb because you didn't do it right. 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 Um, so if you did have that documentation and you had a, a donor that decided not to pay you, you could probably take them to court. You could sue them in small claims court. You could send them to collection. You could do all the kinds of things to be able to retrieve that money. Um, in the entire history of nonprofits, any nonprofit that has ever done that has exploded. Yeah. It is an awful, awful is. idea because it is, it is antagonizing people who have given you money. And even though it is a contract, and as far as the accounting side, you know, the accounting side makes you, uh, when you're putting your financial statements together, you're supposed to actually put in um, a, a separate section that says, this is how much in uncollectible pledges we think we're going to end up. We're, so we're going to book this as an expense. This is money that people have promised to pay us that we've actually booked. 
But now that we look at it, we're probably only going to get 95% of that, so we're going to discount it by 5%. So you're actually supposed to do that when you put your financial statements together. Um, and, and in all instances that I've ever heard of where a, a nonprofit has gone after their donors to, to fulfill pledges, it has not ended well for the nonprofit. No, it's kind of a nightmare and, yeah, not a great relationship-building tactic at all. <laughs> <laughs> that thing's nope. not to do, right? Um, I think a couple things, though, to piggyback off what you said. So I think what's interesting is one thing that you really emphasized was documentation. And I think that's the important piece because sometimes people think just because a donor made a verbal pledge or verbal commitment, that, drunk that, at the gala, right, right? it's like, sorry, no, 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 that doesn't, that's <laughs> not going to hold up, right? That's not going to hold up as, as legally enforceable. So I like the actual process of having something written sort of, you know, like, where I've, what I've seen done, you know, like you said, pledge form, or I've seen it done where donor literally sends a letter saying, this is my intent. Nonprofit accepts it, like to say, we accept your pledge and sends it back to the donor. And I know CPAs love this too, because like it really keeps a nice record trail. And then um, there's this thing, I was actually doing research on this because I knew the, you know, I, I was sort of like, I wonder what lawyers say about this in this, in this industry. And so they were like, there's also got to be consideration given for the pledge consideration, meaning, um, you as the nonprofit show in some way, you're either going to, maybe you're going to name a building after the person. Maybe you're going to recognize, publicly recognize them for their donation. Maybe you are going to, you know, a tax receipt would be considered consideration. But I guess the three components when this is like held up in a court of law are sort of the offer, the offer from the donor, the acceptance from the charity, and then this third weird component called consideration. So I thought this is interesting because um, I think a lot of people may not do all those steps. And so, it, but at the end of the day, it goes back to the question, like nobody should be wanting to take this to collections or to sue somebody because dear God, you're never like the wor- rumor mill beyond that donor being ticked off. Like the rumor mill, it will be all over, right? The media, the rumor mill will spread and you will have other donors who won't want to give to you either. So Yeah. And, and the, the cases that I've heard of this happening is where the nonprofit is in serious, serious trouble, like halfway through a capital campaign and the wheels fall off and then they need money to complete yeah. the building that they're halfway done with. And so they're pressuring donors um, to, to accelerate pledges. Um, and if, if, you give, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's like uh, if you're being hunted as an animal and you you look scared, you're going to get attacked, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> so that's the, you never want to be in that position. You always want to kind of be one step ahead of it and make sure you got your contingency plans in place. And yeah, you should never have to try to send a donor to collection. I think the other side of it too is when donors, donors should recognize that when they are making a pledge, it is actually a contract. They're not, it's not something that they're they're supposed to back out on. Right. Um, so I don't know the best way to inform donors of that, you know, the I can't imagine like putting somewhere on the pledge form that this is an enforceable contract. That's the kind of thing that makes people nervous, but it does. But I almost wonder if just the, the, the sort of back and forth, the set, the donor sends their intent in writing to give such and such you as the charity sign it and send it back. I would hope that extra step might be enough to sort of send up a little, I don't know, like, Hey donor, this is more than just you giving us a hundred bucks or, you know, a a quick donation. Like this is something that's beyond that because we don't do that for normal straight out donations. This is a pledge, right? Right. So I definitely think though, also making sure you have the right, whether you have an attorney or somebody who looks over somebody, maybe attorneys are a bad idea because candidly they would make it too legalese and make it really unfriendly. But But yeah, like how do you take attorney and mesh it with like amazing development relationship building professional to create a nice pledge form? (laughs) Like that's a friendly pledge form, but still gets the point across. <laughs> yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. So yeah, because most pledge forms are really, I mean, they they are insufficient. They have a dollar amount and then they say over X number of years, but then you kind of got, you know, the, as soon as it gets to the accounting department, they're like, okay, explain to me how I divide this by six. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like there's yeah. no easy way to divide. Absolutely. Are they going to give me 67 cents each time? Okay, Stacey, here's a really long question, and it's actually got multiple questions in it, so. Oh, boy. (laughs) I'm holding on to my seat. Our nonprofit has never received memorial donations, but I recently received a call from a woman who wanted to put our organization's name in the obituary in lieu of flowers for her husband who recently passed. Should I attend the service? I'm not sure if it's appropriate, and I wonder if it will look like if I'm just there because of the potential donations. 
I interacted with her and her late husband at a handful of events over the years. So I think it's absolutely appropriate. And I think it also demonstrates the organization's gratitude um, and empathy during a really tough time, right? So I look at that and say, you know, this this couple or the the surviving, you know, wife, um, she she has chosen, this organization was important enough in her husband's life and in their life that she has chosen to, to do this gesture, right, in lieu of flowers. So it's obviously you were important enough for her to include you. I think showing up, absolutely. And you're not going to be sitting there with your hand out hitting, you know, hitting up people and saying, good Don't God, I hope pledge not. Forms. <laughs> if you do, shame on you. But, <laughs> uh, but no, but you know, I, I mean, I think it's absolutely an opportunity to just show your, your gratitude, your tribute to that, that person. Um, and you know, death is such an awkward topic for people. And so I think sometimes it's easier to say, Oh, you know, yeah, I'm not going to go to that because I really didn't know them well enough or whatever. But I think the family would be grateful for your presence. And even if you were just sitting in the back or you just shake their hands and say, you know, apologize for the loss. I mean, do I think it's a requirement? Absolutely not. Do I think it's a nice touch when someone's been kind enough to choose you out of probably a lot of organizations they could have chosen from? Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely. Is there a difference between a board of trustees and a board of directors? Our board insists they be called trustees, but our bylaws lists them as directors. Does it matter? Okay, so this is a full disclosure that I am not an attorney, okay, right? So Neither like of us I, are attorney. So this is not legal advice, but I'm going to steal from, um, I'm going to steal some great advice on this I got from an attorney I know. So, so first of all, I think nonprofit boards sort of look at it, and many people just look at this as synonymous, right? Trustee, director, whatever, call yourself what you want to call yourself, right? So I think there's this general sort of that they're treated as synonyms, like directors and trustees are sort of treated as one and the same, at least that's been my experience. Um, so I had this issue come up and went to, I, you know, I wanted to talk to somebody. And so, I mean, obviously when you think about it, most nonprofits are set up in corporate form and set up in corporate form generally then means you are a director and most many foundations, private foundations, Um, charitable trust are set up in trust form. Not all of them, but many are. And so then there is, you are called a trustee. So from just that differentiation of was your nonprofit set up in corporate or trust form is sort of, in my mind, the basic question for some of this to know what, how you sort of what, what you call yourself, right? But then when you get in deeper, there's actually it, trustees have are subject to higher standards. So trustees who aren't doing, you know, from a fiduciary standpoint, aren't aren't taking like really fulfilling those duties. They're actually held to a bit of a higher standard, for, according to um, my lawyer friend who shared this. So so you also want to you're putting more of a fiduciary burden and people would be more apt to go after them personally as a trustee because there is higher levels of fiduciary standard and could actually go go after their personal assets. So it's you're a little bit more at risk as a trustee if you're not in compliance with what you should be doing. And, and that's the confusion between a charitable corporation where you would have directors and a charitable trust where you'd have trustees because they're yes. two different, they're two different vehicles. Exactly. Okay. So, so if you, if you were a member of a, just a regular old board member of a regular old nonprofit corporation and you called yourself a trustee, even though you're not a, a, a trust, you might, it might open you up Correct. to, to more liability than Correct. you would normally have. Yeah. Okay. That's so, fascinating. So, so it is fascinating. I mean, and it's a little bit because you think about it, right? Like an implication, like everyone's like, who cares? Whatever, whatever, call ourselves. But you really want to be careful about it. And I think there is a weird, I don't know if you've found this, Andy, but like I have found this weird um, level of like prestige that people feel by saying they are a trustee versus a director. Oh, that sounds much fancier. Right, right, <laughs> right. It's, oh, I am a trustee. And I, you know, and I'm kind of, and I've also seen like if you look at, structures, you tend to see university structures, um, higher education structures, they are called trustees. So it's generally, it's interesting. They oftentimes, and I would love to dig to know, well, were you set up 
that like I'm I'm very curious to know about like do they call themselves trustees because that sounds a little bit fancier or are they literally set up in trust form and that's why. Yeah. So I think and part of the confusion I think comes from the fact that not everybody that starts a nonprofit in Nevada is from Nevada and is familiar True. with Nevada law. True. So um, for those of you listening to this outside of Nevada, this is this podcast is taped in Nevada. We're presented yes. to the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits. So a lot of the stuff we talk about is from a Nevada perspective. Absolutely. Um, so NRS, I wrote it down. NRS, I don't just have this memorized, by the way. <laughs> NRS 82.026 actually defines trustees and directors. And here's what it says. It says directors and trustees are synonymous terms. So as far as NRS, goes with the Nevada revised statutes goes they are the same word mm-hmm. so so it might just be that fancier thing that you're talking about yeah um, so so here's a couple other things that I've heard so um, I I heard one person say that they they used to be directors um, but they changed to, to trustees so that they have oversight and budget and operations instead of just being responsible for day-to-day activities as if the directors were a lower level of yeah, board yikes. member who is yeah. responsible for day-to-day stuff. And then once you get to the trustee level, then you're just about oversight. What do you think of that? No, I mean, I almost, that sounds to me like perhaps someone who didn't understand that both, right, directors and trustees have fiduciary duties and have to, you know, are basically responsibility lies with them. So it doesn't matter whether you're called a director or a trustee, it is what it is. But I'm wondering if what you heard came from someone who knew enough about this to be dangerous. What I'm talking about, that trustees are literally legally, when you when you dig into it, are legally held to higher standards. And there's law cases and there's things that have come to fruition, lawsuits, that someone as a trustee has been more um, legally in jeopardy, right, as a trustee versus a director. So I'm wondering if maybe that went into play because that's not accurate at all, right? And yeah, I mean, so and then the, and then the other the other thing I heard was was related to that was that um, specifically university employees were not allowed to join a particular board because they were a a board of directors or a board of trustees, and they needed to change their board name to an advisory board in order to get around something from from not yeah. allowing um, entity employees. And I actually reached out to. Um, Jessica Word, I'm calling you out, Jessica, so people can call you with questions. Yeah. Um, and she she did a quick search of and she code and she couldn't find any. And she's you know she's definitely knows the most about nonprofits as far as I know in in Nevada. Um, she couldn't find anything in and she code about that. And actually, we had came up with a, tons of examples of university employees that are actually encouraged to participate on boards that are actually real boards. So. Um, we're not sure where that was coming from. If you have information about that, um, please let us know. Yes. We'd love to chase that one down. That would yes. be an interesting thing to find out. It's all very complex, and it's interesting because it kind of reminds me of the game of telephone. Like each person, right, has a different <laughs> interpretation or heard something different. Right. And yeah, it's, right. Or it's, they're bringing they're bringing their knowledge from that. New Jersey, where Absolutely. where there are two totally separate things because Absolutely. it's written in state law differently. So, so that could be part of it too. Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, today, I am really excited because we have one of my favorite people we're interviewing for this next question. Um, this is Karen Durkin. Karen is an executive coach with Holdsworth Russo and Company. Her bio says she's passionate about working with executives and leaders striving to achieve their best life and contributing their talents in a fulfilling career. And I can agree with that wholeheartedly. Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. So here's the question. A senior manager who had been with our organization for several years recently left the organization very suddenly, and everyone was notified that this person was no longer employed with us. What are some things organizational leaders should and shouldn't do to manage culture and morale after a high-profile leader leaves an organization in this way? Wow. You know, that really sends an organization into a tailspin because that leader was probably a manager of some people, a peer of others, and, uh, you know, possibly a mentor to some of the younger staff. So the biggest don't I can offer is don't act like nothing happened because something significant did happen. I think that when, when businesses try to brush it under the carpet and think nobody will ask a question, they're wrong because everyone's at the water cooler talking about it. Right. It seems to make it worse, too. If you're silent, then people just start to add their own information in, right? 
oh, and the stories get good, don't they? <laughs> they really do. So I'd like to recommend that if there's anything at all that you can share, share it. For example, if that leader left on their own accord for another opportunity, even if it's to a competitor, for whatever reason, if they left on their own accord, well, you can approach it as a positive um, you know, relationship and they didn't leave no harm, no foul, no hard feelings, uh, so-and-so left to go work with X company. I think that that's always the easiest way to start. But in this scenario, most likely that's not what happened. There was probably an incident of some sort. Is that what you're guessing too? Yeah, that's, that's sound, when, when somebody leaves very suddenly and then everybody's notified that the person <laughs> is no longer employed, that usually tells me there is an HR problem. That's right. That's right. So what you want to do in that case is you can reconfirm that, yes, they left. And it, although that it's an unpleasant uh, disconnection or, or what is it, uh, discoupling, what's that term that's used? Uh, uh, and even though it wasn't something that was anticipated, there was an occurrence that didn't work, or maybe there was a violation of some sort. You don't have to get into detail, especially if there might be legalities involved, like harassment or ethics or possibly fraud or some sort of embezzlement. You do not have to get into that level of detail, but it is okay to say that it wasn't what we wanted, it's an unfortunate incident, and we've lost um, somebody that we worked with for many years. And you can leave it like that. But again, I want to reiterate, if there is anything that you do feel comfortable sharing, you can. And if it's a violation of a well-known policy and people kind of knew about it anyway, if somebody comes and says, is it because they broke this rule? You can confirm that, yes, that's the case. That is our rule. That is our policy. It sounds like you, you would want, in, in those cases, you might want some advice from an attorney if because if you're firing somebody and you don't you don't necessarily want to get in some sort of hot water because of something that you said after the fact but but i do see your point i mean i i think in in most cases you're going to want to put the most positive spin on it either either you know our organization needs to be as strong as possible and this person wasn't wasn't contributing to the level that we expected them to contribute or what you know if you can come up with some, some reason that somebody gets fired that's a positive reason Absolutely. And with reference to your statement about the attorney, if there's a legal implication, you want to not go down the road that could get you into any kind of trouble. So less is better in that case. And you could respond by saying, this is not something that I'm at liberty to discuss at this time. When I get additional information, I promise you I will share it with you. Yeah, and so getting getting that the rumor mill to not start is probably the because I'm imagining a larger organization, right, where, where people disappear and all of a sudden you notice that they gone they're gone because it was a high profile leader and the executives are silent about it and that's probably the worst case scenario. So you're going to want to put some sort of positive you know, positive story about what happened and what's in the best interest of the organization. What, what can you do if you're, you know, what should you do if you're an employee of an organization like this? So, so you, you work there and all of a sudden the CFO vanishes and everybody is around the water cooler talking about what they think may or may not have happened. Is, do you have a responsibility as another employee to, to do something about that? What I think people are most concerned about when they're around the water cooler or they're starting the rumor mill is, is this the beginning of a domino effect? Is this something that may impact me? Are they laying people off? And it's interesting that most, peop most of the times when somebody gets, you know, just goes off the radar very quickly like that, people don't always go to something happened and they were fired. They think that it might be the beginning of others getting fired. So there is a natural reflex of the individual saying, gosh, am I going to lose my job? And that's where you can say that your jobs are not in jeopardy. We are, we are going to be replacing this position. This is how we're going to go about that replacement process. 
because you'll also have people thinking, well, that's my job to take now. And it can just become very confusing and very misleading if you don't offer whatever feedback that you can, whatever insight you can. So it's, it's really the responsibility of the executive team or whoever is that whoever is responsible for for making the firing to make sure that the the narrative is right when it happens i uh, absolutely and i would roll it down cascade it down to all leaders that may be impacted and teams that may be impacted the best way is to announce it face to face emails just generate a little bit more um gossip so if you can, in a team setting, introduce it or explain it face-to-face, -face, it usually just, you know, squashes further discussion a little bit earlier. Yes, yeah, so I'm thinking back to, to situations that, that I've experienced where someone from the executive team may leave suddenly and the... Yeah, sort of the natural inclination of the staff is to to make a big deal about it. That that they're you know yeah they do, and it's and it does seem like it. You know, a lot of times it is. Is this the beginning of the end? Are we all going to go? Right. <laughs> um, so, is is there anything that an organization do you think could do to prepare? So, I mean, obviously, a lot of these things are going to be reactive. Somebody leaves or somebody's fired, and then you need to deal with it. Is there anything you can do in advance to maybe prepare everyone for that kind of thing or be ready for it? Well, it depends on high, how high profile this leader is. If there's a chance that possibly the media will get involved, you should prepare your team ahead of time. This is how we'll be responding to these questions. This is if, if someone from the media calls or, uh, you know, a, um, an entity that is involved possibly calls and asks about it. This is the response that we're going to be giving. So I think that this is a preparation that would be helpful not only to get the message out consistently, but prepare people that are ill-equipped to answer that type of question. You know, it's kind of the knock on the door, this is 60 minutes kind of thing. Nobody's ready for that. No. So uh, that would be a preparation that would be not only helpful, but thoughtful and appropriate. I also want to mention that even if it's a lower-level employee, that's leaving uh, abruptly, you're going to get a similar response. It won't be as far reaching, but you'll get a similar response. So I think the same recommendations would hold true for that scenario as well. You know, where's, where's Bobby? You know, he's gone. It, it's going to disrupt the team for some time if you don't sit down and address it and address whatever you can. Yeah, that makes sense. Actually, that's probably the, the lower level employees are the ones that probably generate the most, you know, is this the beginning of the end kind of question, unless everybody knows that he was a horrible person and we needed to get rid of him anyway, right? Right. And sometimes they're celebrating because <laughs> we were doing work for Bobby anyway. You know, finally, now can we get a working employee? <laughs> <laughs> that, would be, that would be delightful, wouldn't it? <laughs> Well, thank you, Karen. That was fantastic. I really appreciate the time that you've taken to talk to our audience today. Well, you're most welcome. I love uh, addressing these challenging scenarios, so it was my pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. Congratulations. You made it to the end of another episode of Nonprofit Everything. Just as a reminder, Nonprofit Everything is a production of the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits, which is the State Association for Nonprofits in Nevada. And for those of you that are still listening, either because you're too lazy to hit the stop button or um, just because you like listening to us talk, I don't know, by the time I get to the end of a podcast episode, if it's just the filler stuff at the end, I just skip it and go right to the next episode yeah, or do something else. you and me both. So here, so um, because you listened all the way to the end, I'm going to give you um, something, uh, a secret surprise. Ooh. So send us an email. So go to the Nonprofit Everything website page. Go to the Contact Us form. There's like a few of them. There's like a general question. There's a ask a question. There's a whole bunch of questions. Um, in, in that form, send it to us. Put your name, put your email, and, and use the secret password ultraviolet. So if you use the secret password ultraviolet, um, we have a special surprise for you. Thank you.